I've reached a point in my story where a single choice can send me spiraling down into a darkness so black there's no coming back from it. Or I can turn away from the path I've chosen to follow and try to follow a new way back to the light. Both would have devastating consequences not just for me but for the ponies I love. Darkness is the easiest choice. When you sink so far into darkness you don't care about any pony anymore, not even yourself. Therein lies the problem. Going down that path would be easy for me, but my friends, my family, they'd suffer. They'd lose the pony they cared about, the one they wanted to help save from their deadly path she made herself. They would have to watch as I became more like the ponies I hated. They'd watch as I became an animal, a beast, a monster, unlike anything the wasteland has ever seen. Light was the harder choice to make, because for a pony who has committed an unthinkable act like I did, to put herself back into the light would take a lot of willpower and forgiveness. I'd have to accept what I did, overcome the darkness eating away at my soul. I'd have to do better, and show the wasteland that I was not the monster, but the pony who could overcome it all. I'd have to shine brighter than any pony has before. To reach that point, I'd have to forgive myself, and forgive the ponies I saw as evil. That was the only way, a seemingly impossible task, but one I could do if only I could find the speck of light somewhere deep inside. Darkness or light, the star spawn or the courier, Aquila or Shadow Star. One way or another, it was time for me to choose who I'll become. Who am I? Remember, if you run, you won't get far. What I hate about being a unicorn is moments like this. When a pony like the stranger knows all they have to do to stop us is to jam a fucking memory orb onto our horns and off to La La Land we go. When this memory is over, I'm gonna make him pay for this. At least he was too slow to stop me from destroying Mill City Tower. And there's always a silver lining, as Vervain liked to say. With some luck, maybe I was able to kill Stardust with that blast. If not, then I'd still find a way. He's the evil one here, not me. Now that I think about it, what was taking this memory orb so long to start? Why was everything so black? Normally, when I enter a memory orb, there's a moment where the world I knew melt away. And then I slip into the body of whomever I'm reliving of the memory orb. The world melted away like it always did, but now I'm just stuck in some kind of limbo. The stranger thing is, I feel like I'm still in my own body. Only, I knew I wasn't still in the present. A dark voice echoed from around me. Open your eyes, Shadow Star. We don't have much time to talk. Open my eyes? What the fuck is going on? And my eyes are open. Or are they? I'm so confused right now. I tried to open my eyes like the voice said, and what do you know, they were closed. When my eyelids parted, I saw that I was standing in a room, what I'd seen before in a memory of Prides, back when he was still Orichalus. And it was the place where he'd almost killed me with his dark magic. I thought it was in a memory orb. If so, this is the strangest memory I've ever seen. The voice spoke again. You did enter a memory orb, Shadow. But I'm using what little strength I have to hold it back so we can talk. As he spoke again, I realized I knew that voice. My knees went weak and almost fell to the ground as I slid. Is that you, Pride? Yes, and no. The pony you knew was Pride isn't around anymore. Or should I say the pony I used to be isn't around anymore, Star? When you used that super weapon on my shadow form, it stripped me of almost all my dark power. If I hadn't been as fast as I was, you would have killed me altogether. Okay, I know I've been losing it for a while, but there's no way you survived that blast. You're totally dead, dude. I said, looking around. But there he was, the golden unicorn standing next to an open door, watching me with sorrowful eyes. I should have died, but because of my gift, 
I was able to keep a small part of myself alive by attaching a piece of myself to you, Shadow. So you're keeping yourself alive inside my head, too? Great. Like I don't have enough problems with Aquila, I have to deal with an immortal uncle. Perfect. He smiled a little when I said that. No, I'm not in your head or your mind. When you activated that re weapon, I tried to break through the barrier. It was too strong even for me, but I was able to crack it. Just a little. And slip a small piece of shadow to you. I told you, Shadow. I have no true body. I am a living shadow. Nothing more. The body you saw before was a thin shell that I could use to keep my power contained. All I had to do was become part of your shadow. I'm a lot weaker than I was, but if I stayed like this, I could regain what I lost. I could took a step back. If that's true and I'm not going crazy, then why haven't you killed me yet? And why do you keep calling me Star? My name's Shadow Star, or Shadow, not Star anymore. The room around us shifted once again. I found myself back on that day when I destroyed Appleton with one stupid pull of the trigger. Only now I was watching things from Pride's point of view. He was looking down at me as I tried to find a way to stop the blast. He looked up at the sky as the clouds started to vanish and pass that speck of bright light. He looked back at me and pulled all the power he could. He slammed himself into the thin yellow barrier. A small piece of himself broke off and pushed through the tiny crack. The point of view changed again and I saw the small speck of darkness that was Pride fall and latch itself onto the shadow under me. I watched as the larger part of Pride smiled down at me and spoke his last words. Before I could watch the blast destroy the town again, I was back in the room. What the fuck was that? That was the moment when I left most of my power behind so I could survive. As to why I haven't tried to kill you, <laughs> that's easy. Do you remember the moment that our magic connected? I shrugged. Yeah? So what? It took a while. But when you saw those memories of mine, I saw some of yours. Memories you've forgotten. But they showed me who you really are. I watched as a single tear ran down his face. You are my niece. Your star. The filly I cursed with dark magic so many years ago. I looked away. Yeah, and because of you, everything in my life has been very difficult. I know. I wish I would have known who you were from the beginning. Things would have been so different, if only I knew. I rounded on him. Oh, really? You mean that if you knew who I was, you wouldn't have tried to kill me? I don't buy that for a second, Pride. Pride. Yes. The name I took when I became a sin. I was dubbed Pride because of how much I loved my power. My pride is the reason you were hurt. Do you know why I did this to myself and took on the moniker of Pride? Because you feared death? He started to laugh. <laughs> no, I wasn't afraid of death. In all honesty, I wanted to die after I hurt you. I almost killed myself only a few hours later, before the guard came for me. Then I heard that Grimm had found a spell to keep you alive. It wasn't a cure, but it was something. I swore then that I wouldn't let anybody stop me from finding a way to fix what I did. So I went to my notes and found a spell that even King Sombra wouldn't use. I gave up my body and became what you know me as. I dedicated my life to helping my sister find the cure for the darkness I placed on you. When the council couldn't kill me, I swore myself to the Enclave to serve as pride the arrogant. I told them that I would recreate a group like the Children of the Night, only more powerful and more feared. So you became a killer again? He chuckled again. Not at first. It was all a cover so I could get into the Wasteland and help Grimm. For the first couple of years, she stayed at the Crystal Empire, keeping you alive and doing her own research. When she left, I followed her, keeping her safe and alive when I could. I also kept on trying to find a spell or item that could banish the dark magic. I wasn't as good as it as my sister, 
but I still tried. When Grimm went into Stable 28, I lost all contact with her, and I started to take my role as Pride more seriously. When Grimm finally came back out and she told me that you didn't survive, I lost the only thing that I cared about. I became a monster to save you. With you gone, I let the monster take over. And now you magically want to be a good pony again? Bullshit. I'll never be a good pony again. But I've done what I can, when I can, to keep you alive. Like when you were in your stable. I remembered when I found those slaughtered bodies in the halls, and the pony who died in the armory. That was you? The ponies you found in the hallway were mostly security ponies, who found out where you were. They were about to storm the room and kill you. I was able to use the shadows in the vault and use it to kill them, without you even knowing. It was the same situation with the stallion when you were fighting him in the armory. I was also the one who kept you alive when you fought Wrath. I was the one who guided your magic so that you could cast the memory recovery spell on him too. I gave him a quizzical look. Why though? Why do any of this? His purple eyes met mine. Because it's the only way I can help you. When I figured out who you were, I knew I had to do something to make up for what I did all of those years. Glowing angry again, I said, Why bother? Even if that was true, why show yourself now? Because I'm trying to stop you from going down the same path that I did, he retorted. The room around us shifted. Everything changed, and now we stood in a dark cave. I won't watch you make the same mistakes I did, or your mother. Our entire family has always done something bad, ever since the war. You, Star, are the one pony in our family that I think can break this curse on our house. I showed you to myself, so I could show you what we did wrong, so you wouldn't have to go down the same path of darkness. Darkness is all I have left. No, it is not. Yes, it is. Why should I care what path I'm on right now when it... But no matter what I do, my friends die or get hurt, or are taken away and turned into monsters. Even if somehow I could avoid all that from happening, sooner or later, I'll be the new monster in the wasteland. When Aquila breaks down the cage Mom trapped her again in, I'll be evil. Might as well skip right to it and let her take over now. At least this way, I can make sure my friends aren't around when I do. He frowned and walked closer to me. Then he turned and showed me his flank, pointing at his cutie mark. At first it was the same as the mark on Stardust's armor, a tribal lion's head. Then it changed. First two circles showed up, one right inside the other. Then within the circles, zebra glyphs appeared. Then a line started to form on top of the inner circle. It zipped around, making one continuous line to form a six-pointed star. The points on the top and bottom were larger triangles, and the four sides were smaller. The color was the same as his eyes, a brilliant purple. This is my cutie mark star, the one that I had before it was destroyed when I became pride. I looked at it for another minute, then turned away. So what? You have a six-pointed star on your ass. Big deal. He shook his head. Grim really did lack in your education. If you just see this symbol as a six-pointed star. This is a unicursal hexagram. When the hexagram is formed with a single line, it forms a knot. Magic users like me or Grimm use symbols like this to enhance our magical ability. The same for some more powerful and wise zebras. There is always one pony in our family who has some kind of star for a cutie mark. I was the first pony to possess the hexagram. It meant that I would be more powerful than any in our family had ever been. When the hexagram is inside the circle, it is the symbol of Oricalis. On the day I got my cutie mark, I took on that name. Nice. And what does it have to do with me or why I should stop doing what I'm doing? I asked. He walked slowly around me. I'm getting to that. Now shut up and listen. You might learn something for a change. Before you were born, I was the most powerful unicorn to ever be born in the Enclave. 
Before me, no pony in our family had anything more than a four-pointed star. Magic was easy for me. All I had to do was learn a spell, was see it being used, or read it from old spell books. I could take spells that were weak and change them to make far more powerful spells. I learned spells that most unicorns thought were hard or extremely advanced before I was even ten. Because of this, I was put into a special school to hone my skills so that I could become even more powerful. My parents adored me. They darted on me. And they wanted to tell every pony they could about how great I was. They wanted every pony to know that they could use me to get themselves into a high position of the Enclave. As he spoke, everything around us changed again, and another memory started to form. Once again, I was watching the world through the eyes of pride. No, not pride. Or Ekelis. He was a little younger than Wingnut, but I could feel the power he had as he moved eight massive objects in the air, while at the same time writing down something with perfect pony penmanship. He was being watched by two other unicorns. One was a short, light silver mare with a dull blue mane. The other was a yellow stallion with a jet black mane, much like Oricalus. The stallion was saying something as Oricalus strained to hold the spells. Oricalus, we need you to do more. We know you can do it. You have to show every pony how great our family really is. That's right, Ori. If you keep this up, maybe one day every pony in Equestria will know your name, and ours, too. My host dropped the objects. I've been doing this for hours, Dad. Can I take a break, please? You're almost finished, son. Just a little longer, the stallion said. But I promised Spell that I'd help her with her magic today. If I keep this up, I'll be too tired, my host said. Before either of the older ponies could answer, a small, pale blue filly with a long silver mane walked in. Ari, are you finished yet? I found a new book that I want help reading. She froze when she saw her parents glaring at her. Spell, you know not to disturb your brother when he's training, the stallion yelled. The mare stuck her nose in the air and huffed. Don't bother, dear. She'll never understand how important this kind of training is for a unicorn such as Oricalus. She can't even lift a pencil, let alone use spells her brother can. Mom, Dad, don't be so hard on her. She's still a fool. All your cruelty is going to do is make her hate you. Oricalus said, walking past them and over to the small filly. I can help you with whatever you need, Spell. I'm almost finished. The filly was crying as she looked over into her brother's eyes. I... I don't want to get in your way, Ori. The mare pushed past my host and shoved the filly back. That's right. You'd better not, Spell. Now get out of here and go to your room. The filly ran from the room crying and dropped the small book she'd been carrying. When she was gone, the stallion said, She's such a crybaby. She's lucky we haven't disowned her yet by now. To think that one of our children can't even use magic. How pitiful. My host rounded on them. Why can't you two just give her a break? She can use magic. I've seen her. And if you two would just let up on her even a little, she'd be able to do better. So what if she's not as gifted as me? She can still learn. If you spent half the time teaching her as you spent treating me, her like garbage, she'd be just as powerful as I am. But you're too busy polishing your favorite s The mare slapped him. Don't talk back to us, Ori. Your sister is worthless to us and the Enclave if she can't use magic. You know how our family has fallen over the years. We can't let a weakling like her bring us down more than we already are. Ori Callus was shaking with rage now. He backed away from both his parents, with his horn glowing. I'm sick of doing what you think is right, just the Enclave will see us in a better light. You will leave her alone, and let me help her with her spells. If not, I'm not going to do anything to help you. His father laughed. We're your parents, and you will treat us with respect. We are owed. If it wasn't for us pushing you so much, you wouldn't have ever become as powerful as you are now. Now get back to your training! Oricalus didn't move, but his horn grew brighter. He cast a spell, knocking both of his parents onto their backs. Then he used his telekinesis to grasp them both by their throats. He tightened his hold and said slowly, You will do as I say. Or I'll show you just how powerful I am, 
and how broad my imagination for torture has grown over the years of you treating us like tools for your own gain. After I've had my fun with you, they'll never find the bodies, because there'll be nothing left to find. He let up on their throats just a little so they could respond. It was his mother who said first, You can't do this to us, Ori. Why do you care so much about that weak unicorn? She glared at her. Because she's my sister. Now I'm going to her room to help her with her magic use. Both of you will leave us alone for the rest of the night, so she can have some peace. Starting tomorrow, you'll both stop calling her names. You will let her have more time with me so I can help her, and you will treat her as if she is my equal. Do you understand me? If you want, I can carve it on your legs as a reminder. His father responded this time. Fine. Just let us go. He did. Now get out of here. They both got up and trotted out of the room. When they were gone, Oricalus took hold of the book his sister dropped and teleported. He reappeared in a small, dark room. One corner, the filly was sitting there crying to herself as she pulled pages out of a spell book. Stupid mom, dad, what do they know? I can be just as great as he is if only I could figure out how to make the stupid horn work. My host smiled and walked closer. Spell, you shouldn't do that. You know how hard it is to find fully intact spell books. He turned to look at her, her gray eyes shining with tears. I don't care. I've read a lot of these stupid spell books, not a single one helps. Ori Callis pulled out the book she left behind when she ran out. Not this one. Maybe it'll have just what you need. Then he looked down at the title. When he did, I saw it was the same book Mom gave me when we were in the stable. She said it was the first spell book she ever read that helped her become who she was. It was the one book written by Twilight Sparkle. Spell, where'd you get this? I thought no copies of this book were left. She frowned. I found it in the library. One that doesn't think any pony ever found before. Well, what do you care? It's not like that thing can help me either. I'm just useless, like Mom said. He moved closer and pulled the little filly into a hug. No, you're not. You just haven't figured out the way your horn uses magic. She looked up at him again. Are you sure, Ori? I am. Now dry those eyes, and let's read this book together. And maybe you can tell me about this library you found. She giggled a little and dried her eyes. Okay, fine. But I want to read it to you first. Maybe if I do, I'll understand it better. Whatever you think will help again, Spell. The memory faded again, and I was back in the room with Rory Callis looking down at me. I sighed and asked, Was that my mother? He nodded. Yes. As you can see, our parents didn't treat her very well. I was a prodigy. Every spell I tried came to me easily. Grimm struggled with everything. It took her another six months after that memory to finally learn how to even use telekinesis. It happened when she found that statuette of Twilight. Were you two always that close? Yes, we were. I never liked how my parents treated her, so I took it upon myself to help her improve and prove them wrong. Magic was easy for me. I hated it too. Seeing Grimm struggle so much with her own magic gave me a challenge. I liked that. It was great to find something in my life that was finally a challenge he said with a small smile. Still, I wasn't the one that helped her become strong. She did that on her own. What does it have to do with your cutie mark? He sighed and looked at her. Star, when will you realize there's a reason for everything? Maybe you should listen instead of interrupting. The point is, my power was great at a young age, and it frustrated me to no end. That's why I challenged myself whenever I could. In the end, it was that flaw in my character that led to what would happen with you. I was trying to learn and use shadow magic, something I couldn't just learn easily, and was forbidden. I found old journals and spell books in the library your mother found. We called it the Forgotten Library. Those spells took me years to learn, and I still couldn't control them properly. That's why you ended up sick. I lost control of my power for just a second, and that second was all it took. 
I saw the memory of that day. What I don't understand is why that ball of darkness went after me. I wasn't anywhere near it. And you didn't try to cast the spell on me. I said, now getting interested in the story. It's because of that. He said, with a sigh, pointing at my cutie mark. I looked down at it, then asked, What does my cutie mark have to do with what happened? He smiled again. Because since the day you were born, Star, every pony knew that you'd become more powerful than even I was. You used to cast spells when you got upset, if you were hungry. It got so bad that at times Grim had to place wards on you to stop you from casting spells that might hurt you. You were a powerful spellcaster ever since you came into this world. It was a power that drew the dark energy I created towards you. Shadow magic is unlike any other kind there is. It's drawn to light and power. It'll snuff it out just so it can stop something as powerful as you from changing the world. It was my turn to laugh. Me? A powerful spellcaster? That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I'm not kidding. Think about it. How long have you been able to use teleportation? I shrugged. I don't know. Maybe five or six years now? Why? That spell is something most unicorns can't do. And even if they can, they can't do it more than once a day. Maybe twice. I've seen you do other spells that are hard to do. You can even handle multiple things at one time in your telekinesis. I laughed again. I only know three spells. That's because you haven't had any pony teaching you more. And I'm sure there aren't many spell books in your old stable. I raised an eyebrow. And this is because of my cutie mark? No. Your cutie mark is a sign of your power. You have what is known as the octogram, or the points of balance. Each point on the star represents a equality that is important in balance when it comes to magic. He pointed at the point of my star. Beauty, strength, power, compassion, honor, humility, mirth, and reverence. Each of these are what is needed for perfect balance. In either magic or a pony, each one is a quality I'm sure you possess. I looked at him with a bored expression. As educational as this all is, why should I care about any of this? He sighed again. Because you need to understand who you are and where you come from. Only then can you understand why you need to turn away from this dark path you're on. Great. Can I go now? I'm really sick of dealing with you. I don't care about you, my mom, or our family. I turned and tried to find a way to get out of this... whatever I was trapped in. Where's the exit? You will listen to me! He yelled. I turned back to look at him and saw his body had become the dark shadow monster I fought in Appleton. You can't keep this up, Star. If you do, you'll end up just like Grimm and me. So what? I said quietly. It seems that it runs in the family, so why should you or I care? I'm going to make everyone in the Enclave pay for killing Aura. Then what? Once you've killed the ponies that have wronged you, what will you do then? He asked. Then either I'll let Aquila finally have what she wants, or I'll kill myself if I can. He hit me, throwing me into one of the walls. If this was real, it would have either killed me or at least hurt like hell. I got up and laughed. What was that for? Not like you can kill me in here, Oricalus. That may be, but I can still knock some sense into you. I just shook my head. All you are is was left of an evil pony that doesn't know how to die. Go away and let me get back to what I was doing before you decided to interrupt my life. You've done enough harm, Oricalus. I don't need your help. You don't care about me. You only care about yourself. That's all. I care more than you know, Star. Stop calling me Star! My name's Shadow. That's all I am. I shouted. Maybe I'm like you. I'm just a Shadow. That's only good at killing. He took a step back and sighed. One day, Shadow, you'll see that I'm right. I can't hold this spell any longer. So I'll let you go. 
I just hope that you find your way back into the light. Because I know what really lies in the darkness. It's pain, loneliness, and hardship. I never want to see your face again. You understand me? If you are really living inside my shadow, either stay like that and never show yourself again, or find some other pony to bother, like Grim. She might need your help soon, because once I'm finished killing Nightshade and Stardust, she's next. I said, powering up my horn. If that's what you think you need to do, then fine. But I warn you, she won't be as easy to kill as you think. The same goes for Nightshade. Remember, revenge is never the answer. Take it from some pony who knows. His body was starting to fade, along with the rest of my surroundings. I smiled with the same evil grin I'd seen Pride use before. Vanish from the world, Orticalis, and never return. I shot a blast of energy at him. He just smiled as the world around me shattered. My body felt as if I was falling. Then everything melted away. This time, the memory started as I expected it to, though the meeting with Orikalis was still fresh in my mind. What did he really want, anyway? He had to be planning something. It didn't matter what or who he was. He was still a sin, one that was more dangerous than the rest of them, apart from maybe envy. Either way, I was going to have to find out. Get him out of my shadow or head or whatever. Right now, I was once again stuck in a memory orb the stranger put me into. Either he just found some random memory orb or wanted to use it to keep me knocked out, or he wanted me to see this. The world around my host came into focus, and as soon as it did, I knew something was different from the other ponies I have watched memories of before. At first, I thought it was an earth pony. He didn't have a horn or wings, or so I was in good shape. Then, I noticed my host didn't feel like a pony. Sure, he had hooves like a pony, and the shape felt the same. But, still, I didn't think this was a pony. Then my host turned his head, and I saw a small mirror. He was a zebra. Not only was he a zebra, he was the same zebra who attacked Nightstalker and his team when they went after the Pegasus, who betrayed Equestria. In the last memory, I hadn't gotten a good look at him, apart from his short-cut mane and a pattern of his stripes. His black stripes were thicker, his white thinner. His eyes, I knew didn't see properly because of the last memory orb. If I had, I wouldn't have forgotten. They were orange towards the pupil, almost like a hot iron. The color changed as it got closer to the sclera. It went from a deep orange to a redder orange. Then right at the end, the color became a brilliant red. With the almond shape of his eyes and the changing color, I couldn't help admire how beautiful they looked. All in all, he was a very handsome zebra, even if his mane had gotten long and unruly since the last time I saw him. My host started to turn around, looking around what had to be some cell of some kind. The only sort of bars and a small cot to sleep on, like the cells in Stable 28. This was a nice-sized room with large glass windows, looking out at a hallway. It had a thick steel door, another small window looking out in the same hall. The cell had a bed, a desk, and a bookshelf with a few books on it. On one end was a private bathroom that even had a shower in it. If I was locked away in a cell, I'd be fine with it. It looked more comfortable than my own room back in my stable. The door opened, and a light brown mare with a magenta-colored mane and pink stripes running through it. Her eyes were a bright purdot. She had a couple of freckles, and her cutie mark was a pair of scissors with apples for the handles. She had a tray of food in her muzzle that sat down on the desk. When she was finished, she looked back toward my host. Zappin, what are you doing up so damn early? I thought you'd be sleeping still. My host frowned and sighed. I'm always up at an early hour, Babs. You should know that by now. She shrugged. You've only been here a couple weeks. I wasn't the last location very much. He laughed a little. But you have been bringing me my breakfast every day all week. Yeah, but never this early. I will admit it is strange to see you around so early. Is something wrong? Nah, I just couldn't sleep last night. 
So I figured I'd get your breakfast done earlier. That, and because the captain wants to have a word with you soon, I figured you'd want to have something to eat before he does. She replied. My host frowned. I can guess what he wants. My host walked over to the desk and sat down, eating the nicely prepared salad. Yeah. The last bit of information you gave us didn't pan out. He's not in the best of moods right now. My host rolled his eyes. Is Night Stalker ever in a good mood? He always seems so angry. I don't have time for that kind of shit, Zappin. Night Stalker said from the doorway. They both turned to look at the gray Pegasus. He wasn't wearing any armor. Without it, he didn't look as menacing. Apart from the stern look on his face. I see Babs took care of your breakfast. My host nodded his head. She is a kind mare. I think country hospitality runs in her family. Even if she's from the city. Night Stalker said. We should get started if you're ready. I do not have much of a choice, now do I? Night Stalker smiled. You always have a choice, Zappin. My host chuckled. Yes, but with you, it is either do as you say or die. To me, I see no other choices available. Be it good or bad, a choice is still a choice. Night Stalker looked over his shoulder and yelled, Amethyst Star, would you come in here, please? A pale unicorn with a dark purple mane and a lighter purple highlight swung in. She had three diamonds for a cutie mark. Yes, Captain. You have the device you and Manette designed. Of course I do, sir, she said, pulling out a small black collar. I have it right here. Min said she worked out the last bugs last night. Good. Night Stalker said, taking the collar and holding it out to my host. Put this on. My host looked at it like it was a rat roach. What is that thing? Security. Now, put it on. My host took the collar and put it on. When the collar clicked shut, a small shock went through my host. He jumped. What was that? Amethyst Star blushed a little and said, It's an electric shock. The collar does that because the spell matrix we built into it needs to connect with your nervous system. It shouldn't do that again, though. My host pulled the collar a little. I feel like a pet. Prisoner. Pet. Not much of a difference. Night Stalker said with a small chuckle. It is bad enough that you have kept me a prisoner here for a little over a year. Now you have me walking around in a collar. I'm the third son of the Khazar. My host complained. Night Stalker looked at my host with a confused expression. Then he looked over at Babs. Didn't you tell him? Tell me what? Babs' eyes went wide. I didn't have a chance to yet, Captain. I was about to when you walked in and slipped my mind. Night Stalker sighed. We'll chalk that up to bad timing, then. What are you talking about, Night Stalker? My host asked his voice getting louder. I will tell you in a moment. First, we should get out of the stuffy room. We have a lot to talk about. No, we will talk now. Tell me what you meant. As my host started to yell, the collar around his neck let out an electric shock. My host gagged and fell to the ground. He tried to scream. I know I was. But the electric shock was so powerful it didn't let him. But it lasted a few seconds, but it was enough to keep the zebra down. Night Stalker just watched as my host twitched. When the pain finally started to recede, he said, I should have explained what that collar does before, Hoof. You see, if you threaten any of the children of the night, yell at us, make demands, or try to leave, the collar will shock you. Zeppin took a deep breath before he responded, You are a monster. I'm not. Trust me. You see, Zeppin, even with all the information you provided, I can't trust you. Though because you've been so helpful, I wanted to give you a little more freedom. So, this is my compromise. You'll be allowed to go just about anywhere on this floor, but you'll still be locked in this room at night. As long as you stay civil, you won't have any problems with the collar. My host got back to his hooves and glared at Night Stalker. 
Have I not shown you by now that you can trust me? Nice talker smiled again. I don't trust anyone, Zappin. You should know that by now. But if you do prove to be an asset, then I may have the collar taken off. My host sighed and shrugged. It is better than being stuck in a cell all of the time. Anyway, where are we going and why? Night Stalker looked back at the other two of his team. You two go check on the reports we got in from Thunder Lane. They both saluted, but before Amethyst could run off, she moved closer to Night Stalker and said quietly, Can we talk later? Night Stalker nodded. Then she was gone, following Babs out of the room. Night Stalker looked back at my host. We're going to the main room. I need to go over a few things with you. My host followed Night Stalker as he walked out of the room. This is about a zebra commander you've been looking for? The hall past the room wasn't very long. It only had one other room with a steel door like the one on my host was staying in. It led out to a large open space that looked like it would be perfect for ponies to relax in. The walls were floor-to-ceiling windows that overlooked... New Pegasus? No, it was still intact. As my host got closer to the windows, I could see that there were many more casinos than there are now. I could see another part of the city visible up in the clouds. Ponies of all kinds were taking balloons and elevators up to the cloud part. The sun was coming up and it made for a beautiful view of Lost Pegasus, a city in its heyday. Where are we? It looks like... Las Pegasus, but I do not remember such a tall building in the city, my host said. This is Las Pegasus. We're in a new casino called the Lucky Horseshoe. It just opened two weeks ago. We moved you from our old base to here once we had this section of the tower set up. This is the new base for the Children of the Night, Night Stalker replied, walking up to the window to look down at the ponies on the strip far below. That is rather clever. Hiding a base in a casino, I mean, my host said. It also provide a lot of safety for your team. That it will. Night Stalker stopped as another pony walked in. My host looked over at as lightning dust walked in the room. Ah, lightning. I didn't know you were back yet. I saw Night Stalker's face light up as she came in. She smiled and trot over to him, kissing him for a moment. Whoa, what the hell was that? Did Night Stalker just mess around with every mare? And something happened between the memory with him and Luna. Zappin said he was in the custody for a year. The memory I saw of Luna wasn't long after the fight with Zappin. I'm guessing it's the latter. I just got back, and I heard you were going to talk to Zappin. Lightning said. Then she looked past Night Stalker and smiled at my host. Hello, Zappin. It's nice to see you out and about. It is nice to be out, my host said. I did not know you two were together. Yeah, same here. We haven't told any pony apart from the rest of the team. Night Stalker said, scratching the back of his head. It's still new. You two make a good couple. My host said with a small smile. Lightning blushed. Thank you, Zappin. Anyway, why is he out here and not in his cell? I was wondering the same thing. My host said. Night Stalker sighed. I was going to have this conversation alone, but I guess it can't hurt if you're here, too. Zappin, first I needed you to let you know that we're still having trouble finding the zebras we were told about. We've checked out every location you provided, and each one has had signs that ponies or zebras were there not long before we got there. I have a feeling that some pony is feeding them information about my team and their movements. I hope you do not think that is me. I have no way of communicating with any of my father's forces. No. We don't think it's any pony, like you or anyone on the team. Matt and Amethyst Star have both been busy checking the memories of the team and nothing was found. The other ponies that we know of are my team or a couple of ponies in the MOA. Do you think any pony would be giving the zebras the info? Or do your kind have any way of knowing what you're up to? My host took a moment to respond. Both are possible. Getting a spine to the MIA is hard. But not impossible. Though for them to reach the level of clearance to find out about the kind of information we would be discussing would be very difficult and risky to the pony we sent in. I believe it's more likely that the zebras are looking for a new way of watching for when your ponies or griffins are searching. Lightning spoke up. 
Wouldn't it be impossible for a large number of zebras to move around without anybody seeing? Once again, it is difficult, but not impossible. We zebras are very good at moving stealthily with enough mist to water our cloaks, and a small force could pull it off. I was thinking the exact same thing, but I wanted to make sure, Night Stalker said. If you were the one leading them, where would you go next? What makes you think that the new location would turn out any differently than they have before? I don't. But I didn't ask you if you knew where they were going next. I asked you what you would do if you were the one they were looking for. I see. My host said, sounding a bit puzzled. Well, I would want to stay someplace close to Las Pegasus, if that was the place that they wanted to strike. If I knew that your team was looking for me, I would... My host paused, and after a second, Night Stalker asked, You'd what? Shit. Wouldn't they think of this any sooner? My host said anxiously. Think about it. You've been out here for the past year, trying to find a moving band of zebras. They keep eluding you, but always leaving behind something that you'd find so you'd keep searching. Yeah. And? Think about the Night Stalker. To attack Las Pegasus or the airbase near it, they would need a large force to take it down. It would take some time to get that many zebras this far into Equestria, and no matter what they did, some pony would notice something like that, like you have. So to keep your main force from being discovered, what do you do? My sucker's eyes went wide. You use a decoy. Exactly. The smartest thing to do is to have a few of your zebras go out and keep moving locations, making sure to keep the ponies hunting them on their trail. If I am right, they will have a large force hiding somewhere here that can remain unnoticed. Where in those pegasus could hide that many zebras? Lightning asked. But the only place I could think of is Crimson Canyon. There's a lot of caves and other places that near there where you could hold hundreds of zebras. My host replied. Lightning laughed. That can't be it. That was the place we first checked. Nice Stalker spoke up. It was. But it was back when we first started looking and before Zappin started helping us. They wouldn't have had many zebras yet. They could have hidden without much effort. Once they started hunting them over the year, in other areas, they knew we wouldn't go back to the canyon. It is right. If you send in a scout with a stealth buck, you might be able to catch them. Not a bad idea, Zappin. Thank you, Night Stalker said. He knows how to say thank you. Who is this Pegasus? Zappin looked back out the window. I didn't like the thought of your ponies going in to attack and kill my fellow zebras. I don't plan on killing them all. If any of them surrender, I'll make sure they're given to the MOM. Night Stalker said. I know. It is still hard for me to betray my homeland like I have. You told me yourself that you wanted to help end the war. I think you also told me that you didn't like your father that much, and you wanted to get back at him for sending you on a mission that where we captured you. It's the only reason I've kept you with me instead of giving you to Pinky. He sighed. I know what I said. I was angry, and also felt bad for killing one of your ponies. I didn't cocked her head. How did you feel bad for that? Sure, we weren't happy about it, but that's what happens in war. You lose family or friends. I was angry at the time, and when they attacked, I did not intend to kill her. I'm sorry that I did that. At least you feel that way, though I'd rather not have lost her. Phoenix Heart was a good soldier, and a good friend. Night Stalker said solemnly. I know, you have told me this before. Anyway, apart from this problem with finding the... Night Stalker sighed, then turned to look at my host. I might as well get the bad news out of the way. Since we captured you, we've been trying to set up another meeting with your people. We plan on using you as a bargaining chip to get your father to stand down, or at least talk to us about peace again. Yes, I think that you told me that before. Did he refuse or make demands that you cannot meet? Worse. Last night, we got a message from him. The Khazar said that no son of his would ever be so weak as to get captured and stay in captivity. He announced to the rest of your kind that you're dead. At least as far as he's concerned. As of right now, you're just a random zebra who had his title stripped and your name taken away. 
He told us that we could throw you into a pit to rot, and that Zappin is no longer the name of the zebra we have as our prisoner. My host stood there, shocked for a moment, looking at both Night Stalker and Lightning Dust. When he could finally speak again, he sounded like he was ready to kill his father. How dare he! Does he not know about fighting, when all he's done is sit around making his subjects fight for him? He sent me to Equestria on what he knew would end up being a suicide mission, or at least one that would get captured doing so. Now he has the balls to disown me. The only son he has that is any of real use to him. Zappin, calm down, please, Night Stalker said. No, do not call me that anymore. My name has been taken from me. Lightning Dust looked at Night Stalker, then back at my host. Then, what should we call you? I do not know, Lightning Dust. But it's my father. No. The Khazar took away my title and name from me. Then I have no family. No name. No ties to my kind. I am a dead zebra now. I am an outcast. A nameless one. My host said as his voice was shaking with rage and sadness. Night Stalker smiled. I know a thing or two about taking on a new name, and I may have a solution. First, I want to know something. My host glared at Night Stalker. What is it, Captain? You've been a big help to us over the last year, even though you knew it could lead to your own death. Even though you've killed one of my teammates. I've kept you alive and shown you the respect that I'm due. Since you're nameless now and without a tie to your tribe or family, Will you serve me as one of my children of the night? If you say yes, you will not be a fully trusted member of my team. Not until you prove yourself. But I can give you a name and proper respect and purpose. My host frowned, taking a moment to think. You want me to change my loyalties? To work for you who serves Nightmare Moon? No. I want you to help me serve my nation. With the knowledge you have as a prince, sorry, former prince, you can help me in many ways. Princess Luna is not Nightmare Moon anymore. She hasn't been for a long time. She's the princess of the night and a good mare, Night Stalker replied. I host smiled a little. If I do this, can you promise me that once say I will be free to do as I wish? He nodded. Once we win this war and find a path that leads us to peace with Rome, then yes, I'll make sure you are freed. I'll even make sure you have a good life here in Equestria. My host chuckled to himself and moved closer to Night Stalker. May I borrow a blade? Night Stalker hesitated for a moment, then looked at Lightning Dust and nodded. Just remember, that collar will go off if you try to attack me. I have not forgotten, my host said as he took the small dagger from lightning. My host made a small cut in his foreleg, then let three drops of blood fall to the floor. He bowed his head, taking his forehoof and drawing a symbol on the ground. I could only imagine it was a zebra glyph. The glyph had a plus and a cross overlapping each other. By my blood, I swear myself to you, Captain Nightstalker, leader of the Children of the Night. I will serve you and whomever succeeds you as the leader. I swear this oath, and will hold it dear till my dying day, or until I am released of my services. You understand that a blood oath is a serious thing even here in Equestria, right? Night Stalker said. I do, and I will still make it. My father has gone too far and is blinded by his power. I cannot serve someone like him anymore. I would rather help Equestria win this war. Then rise, and be forever known, not as Zappin, but as Noir, the newest member of the Children of Night. My host rose with a smile. I could feel his body relax, as if his new name freed him from the stress he was holding on at the time. Noir, I like it. Thank you, Captain. Now, how may I help serve you? Night Stalker walked over to an intercom that was in the wall and spoke into it. Minette, would you please bring out that new outfit that I had you made? Yes, sir! The mayor said excitedly. 
There was a bright blue flash of light, and Manette was standing next to him. Her smile as big as ever. Nice stalker chuckled. Do you always have to make a flashy entrance? She looked over at him curiously. What do you mean? I'm just getting here as fast as possible. Never mind. How about you show our newest member what you have? My stalker said, pointing a hoof at the bag she had on her neck. She pulled it off and pulled out some kind of suit. It was all black and looked thin and tight. There was also a helmet and a full mask that only had eyes open and a pair of orange goggles. It's a modification I made to the sneak suit we found on some zebras. I've imbued a few gems into it. It'll mask any sound that you make while it's on. The helmet will also make it so you can listen on conversations, and... Last, it will deflect small caliber ammo and some laser weaponry, too. My host looked at it and ran his hoof over the thin, silky fabric. It is wonderful. Is it for me? Yes, it is, silly. The captain wanted it ready to go, just in case something like this happened. Manette replied. My host looked at Nightstalker. You planned this. Nightstalker smiled a little. Not everything. When I got the information about your father, what he planned on doing, I had a feeling you'd want to strike back at him. I didn't know if you'd accept my offer or not, but in case you did, I wanted to have everything ready. My host looked at the outfit. It was a good plan. I do have one favor to ask you, though. What's that? In the year that I have been here, I have watched you train a few times. You are a mighty warrior, but you are not a good hoof-to-hoof -hoof fighter. Little anger came to Night Stalker's eyes. I'd watch what you say. I was the top of my class when it came to hoof-to-hoof -to -hoof combat. My host chuckled. With a pony, yes. But if you ever want to hold your own against a zebra like one of my brothers, or my father's personal guards or generals, you will need more training. I would like to help with that, if you'd let me do this. Lighting Dust giggled. He has a point, Night Stalker. Finally, Night Stalker relented. Fine. If you think I need more training, then we will test your theory out. If you can win in a fight against me, then I will let you train me. My host's smile widened. Then what are we waiting for? Let's get started. I like his enthusiasm, but I think we should let him see Babs first. Lighting said. Nice stalker laughed. I think you're right. He does need a main cut. My host ran a hoof through his long maid. I think you are right. A main cut first, then we fight. I woke up with a jolt, looking around, wondering where the fuck the stranger was. I took a quick look around the place I was in. There was a small room with a table in the middle of it, three microphones and some recording equipment next to the table. There was a terminal sitting in one corner and a door that led to another room. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. My hooves were tied up. The knots looked simple enough to undo, though. I tried to do my magic to undo them, but ended up screaming as something stabbed into my horn. The pain went away as soon as I tried to stop using my magic. I wouldn't do that if I were you, the voice of the stranger said. I looked up and saw him standing next to the door. I yanked on my bindings. Let me out of here! I can't do that. Not until you calm down, he said. Fuck you! What the hell did you do to me anyway? I tied you up and took you to a safe place in Saint's Parish. We need to lie low for a while. I meant with the fucking memory orb! He shrugged. It made it easier to get you here. Are you going to calm down and listen to me, or are you going to keep acting like an aberrant little snot? I'm not going to do anything you... Wait, a what? I was confused. Did you just call me a snot? I'm not going to repeat myself. Do you know what the fuck you just did? I grinned a little at his question. Yeah. I took out a shit ton of Enclave pricks in their giant building. No. You killed at least ten Enclave soldiers, the High Council, fifteen Pegasi who ran the tower itself, and thirty normal citizens. Not to mention the guards who were trapped inside that thing when your weapon went off. 
I think all they deserved. Oh, did they? So every pony there deserved to die? Did they have anything to do with what happened to your friend? He asked angrily. They were Enclave. What does it matter? He walked over to me and slapped me. They were innocent, you immature foal. You killed ponies that had nothing to do with what happened to you or your friends. They had families. Children that won't ever see them again because of you. A female voice came from the doorway. Looking up, I saw a pinkish-purple griffin with dark blue along her wings and at the edge of her head feathers. There's no need to hit her, you know. The stranger looked back at her. Stay out of this. She frowned. I'm letting you hide here. The least you can do is keep her yourself from abusing her. The stranger sighed and looked at the griffin. I know that, Kitty. But she needs to check that attitude. Kitty looked at me. She's the one that blew up Mill City Tower, isn't she? The stranger growled a little. Yes, she did. He lifted the rangefinder and showed it to the griffin. And that stupid-looking gun took out the tower? Kitty asked, giving the rangefinder a quizzical look. This stupid gun is more powerful than you'd think. Did you see the tower fall? Give that back to me! I yelled. He turned around. You aren't getting this back. You've proven to be too childish and irrational to have a weapon like this. It's mine! I gave my word to a zebra colt I'd keep it safe. I'm sure you did. But I'm sure he didn't know what it was, and even if he did, he wouldn't want you to use it the way you have. He shouted. Kitty walked over to me, looking me over. Why are you so angry? I glared at her. It's none of your business. You're in my home. In here, everything is my business. She said, her face softening a little. I can see that you're in a lot of pain right now. Of course I am. I have something on my head blocking my magic, and I'm tied up. Just leave her be, Kitty, the stranger said. The griffin ignored him. What's your name again? I didn't feel like talking to her. I might be able to get her to help me out of this. Shadow. Shadow, when I said you're in a lot of pain, I didn't mean physically. I meant emotionally. I looked away from her. You wouldn't understand. Her smile never left her face. Maybe not, but we won't know unless you try explaining it to me. She's losing her mind, that's what's wrong, the stranger said. Kitty looked back at him. You're not helping. The stranger sighed. Fine. Whatever. I looked at the stranger for a moment. That wasn't the type of reaction I'd expected him to have. Kitty looked back at me. Why did you attack the tower, and what was the reason you thought destroying it was a good idea? I could feel tears in my eyes as I said, I lost someone. Miva lost someone's shadow, but you don't see us going around and killing so many ponies like that. You're all too weak or scared to go after the Enclave. I'm not. I'm going to destroy them, even if I die in the process. I said furiously. Kay looked sad for a moment. Then she reached out and put a talon on my shoulder. I tried to pull away, but she held on too tight. If you died, what good would it do for the ponies, zebras, and griffins that look up to you? I don't care about them. I never asked you with a courier. I just wanted to escape my stable. Just wanted to save my friends. I never wanted to be the mayor others look up to. If I die, they'll find other ponies to look up to like some kind of fucking hero. Boo-hoo, get over yourself. The stranger said mockingly. That took me by surprise. Looking over at him, I asked, Who are you? You know who I am, dumbass. The stranger replied. No, I don't think I do. Who the hell are you? I yelled. Katie looked at the stranger, then back at me. He said that he knew you. He's the one who brought you here. Really? Did he leave at any point while I was in the memory orb? Yeah. Once to check on the patrol I was doing. He was only gone for ten minutes or so. Kitty responded. What does that have to do with anything? Stop getting so agitated, he said. 
I gave him the hardest of glances. You said you were bringing me back to the kingdom. If so, then why am I here? Because Enclave patrols are swarming the skies? I had to take you someplace safe until things died down, which they haven't. I looked back at Kitty. That's not the pony I know. He's an imposter. Kitty looked at me for a moment, then asked, Are you sure? Moving closer to her, I said, Ask him what I call him. Kitty looked back at him and asked, What does Shadow call you? He paused, and that was all I needed. You don't know, do you? He sighed. Fine. I'm sick of this game anyway. I don't even know why I decided to do this. It's a fucking pain in my ass. You need to get this magical blocking thing off my horn, Kitty. He might be Envy. No, you don't, Kitty. The stranger said, walking over towards us. I'm not Envy, but I am a pony. She knows. I don't know who you are, but if you're not the masked pony, then who are you? Because he's the one we work with, and if you did something to him, you're in deep shit, buddy. He sighed and pulled off his hat. His eyes changed as soon as the hat was off, from green to a brilliant blue. A pink mane was just visible under the bandages of his hat. He pulled down the bandages to reveal... Her face? She then pulled off a voice modulator and smiled. He was right. You did see through the disguise. My eyes went wide. Solstice? Why the hell are you here? The griffin looked between the two of us. I wasn't expecting a mare. Who is she, Shadow? Solstice? She's an Enclave soldier... officer? I don't know. She's just bad. Former? Solstice said flatly. What do you mean? And where's the stranger? She looked over at Kitty, then back at me. He's the one who first brought you here? He's been friends with the radio ponies for a long time. He needed to hide you here so he could go back to Nimbus to see if there was any way he could get you out of here safely. He knew that you'd wake up before he could get back, so he called me and gave me a spare outfit and this hat that he said would make my eyes look like this. He wanted me to watch you until he got back. He wanted me to keep you as calm as I could while we waited. That doesn't answer my color question. Why did you say former? I saw a flash of anger in her eyes, then it faded and she sighed. After I was found in Halo 1, the Enclave decided I was too much of a liability and not ready for my job. I was too young to handle my job as an officer, they said. I was demoted and sent to work as a guard. I tried to beg my commanding officers to give me another chance, but they told me that if I kept it up, they'd brand me. They thought I was getting soft. They said I let you escape to Halo 1. That doesn't explain why you're here and not back in Stratus. I had to run away. Are you happy now? I refused to work as a guard just because I had a couple of bad missions. They threatened my parents if I didn't do my job along with branding me. So I did the only thing I could. I ran. I may have been angry at the situation I was in, but I couldn't help but feeling sorry for Solstice right then. What about your parents? She rolled her eyes. They'll be fine. Dad's a former officer and retired with higher honors. Mom still works with our intel department. They're both highly respected and not ponies they'd hurt her brand just because their daughter went rogue. They might have told me they'd do something to them if they didn't do what I was told, but I found out that they were only bluffing. A friend of mine who's a captain told me as much before I left. Kitty spoke up, finally. But if they catch you, they'll brand you. Stolstice huffed. Yeah, I know. Actually, I was trying to escape a wing of Pegasi when I ran into the stallion in the hat. What'd you call him? The Stranger? I nodded. He's never told us his real name, and he said I could call him the Stranger, so I do. Kitty chuckled. Sounds better than what Bitmap named him. But we called him the Masked Pony. It's kind of a mouthful. I couldn't help smiling as she said that. Then I looked back at Solstice. So you met the stranger, and then what? After he took out the ponies that were following me here, he said that he saw me with the fight at Frosty Summit. He asked me what I did to earn the wrath of the Enclave, and I told him my story. He said he was heading to Nimbus in the Twin Cities, and asked if I'd be willing to travel with him to help him with something. He said if I did, 
he'd help me get into the kingdom. I heard they'd taken ponies like me who run away from the Enclave. I sighed. So you were good to help him so you could get in? She nodded. He told me before he left that something bad happened to you and you needed help. I wanted to use this as a way to repay you for letting me live both times we met. I was kind of a bitch to you. Yeah, and I don't see you being much nicer to me now. I'm fucking hogtied! Kate looked over at me and frowned. And the stranger is the one who tied you up. He said not to let you out of your bonds until he got back. It's not like I can do anything if I'm untied. I don't have my stuff and my magic is useless at the moment. It's getting really uncomfortable laying like this. Solstice sighed. Sorry, Shadow, but I can't let you loose. I would if I could, but I have my orders, and I won't betray the trust the stranger put in me. Fuck. Worth a try. Fine. Do either of you know when he'll be back? No, we don't. But I hope it's soon. Poker Chip and Bitmap will be back soon. We have a show to record. Tell our reporter what happened to Mill City Tower. Ponies are freaking out right now. Kitty answered. Where are they, anyway? I asked. Getting supplies and talking to some of the locals? Solstice replied. Correction, we were talking to locals, now we're back! The voice of Poker Chip said a moment before he walked into the room. He was a reddish-orange unicorn with a light blue and silver-striped mane. He had a Poker Chip that had a spade on it, similar to the chips I saw at the Applewood. Following behind him was a taller, purple... Earth Pony Stallion, with a dark red mane. His cutie mark was a terminal. He looked at us and gave me a kind smile. Look at that, Poker Chip. The masked pony's a mare and our guest is awake. Poker Chip laughed. Well, look at that. Good morning, Courier. I'm Poker Chip. This is Bitmap. I see you've already met Kitty. Yeah, nice to meet you. Can any pony please tell me why I'm really here? I yelled. Bitmap chuckled nervously. <laughs> She's kind of a little angry mare, isn't she? What do you expect from a mare with a reputation like hers? Pokerchip asked. To answer your question, Courier, I have no idea. The masked pony asked us to watch over you when he left, but it looks like he is a she, since I see the outfit lying there on the floor. Solstice sighed. I'm not the stranger or masked pony. I just work for him. I owed him a favor, so I dressed up like him, so when Shadow woke up, she wouldn't freak out. At least as much as she would have if it was just Kitty here. A lot of good that did her, too. Shadow saw through it rather quickly, Kitty said. What took you two so long? Damn. I was hoping I'd get to find out who it really was. Pokerchip said, then he looked at the Griffin. Enclave patrols everywhere. They're stopping any pony they see in both cities trying to find out if they know who shot down Milton at the tower. It took a lot of bribes and lies to get us back here in one piece. Yeah, they're setting up checkpoints on most of the streets, too. If wasn't for Poker Chip, I wouldn't have made it back. Why? I couldn't help asking. Poker Chip answered. Since I'm sure this is your first time in Saints Parish, I'll explain. The Enclave of all kinds of hierarchy. Pegasi on the top. They're the only ponies who can hold any kind of power. They're the first-class citizens. Unicorns like myself are more like a second class, though we can get high in the Enclave ranks if we try hard enough. Earth ponies are just seen as third class, or dirt to the Pegasi. They don't like them at all. There are very few in the Enclave, and most of them live around here. When something bad happens, like what you did to the tower, they always blame the Earth ponies first. I frowned. That's all kinds of fucked up. I grew up in a stable full of Earth ponies. Apart from them treating me like shit most of the time, they were good ponies. Well, most of them at least. Poker Chip looked over at Kitty. Kitty, if I were you, I'd stay indoors for a while. At least till thing quiet down some outside. I was planning on it anyway. I don't feel like being thrown in jail again just because some guard isn't like what I am. Let me guess, Griffins are hated the most? I asked. Solstice was the one to answer. The Enclave doesn't hate Griffins, but they don't trust them either. Their entire culture revolves around mercenary work. It makes them unpredictable. Bitmap nodded. Yeah, Kitty's the only Griffin who lives in Enclave territory right now, and that's because she was orphaned here and grew up in the streets. She doesn't live 
her life like most griffins. Kitty laughed. It's true. I'm more of a pony than a griffin. I don't understand the whole contract thing, nor do I care about it. It's the only reason they let me live here. If I was to take up a town company, though, they'd change their minds about me rather quickly. Figuring, since I couldn't do anything right now to get free, I thought I'd at least try to learn more about these three. So how'd you end up here? Kitty shrugged. My parents were working for an enclave officer when I was rather young. They were both freelancers back then and didn't care who they worked for as long as they got caps. When they would go off on a job for this officer, I'd stay at his home in Nimbus. One day, they were off on a job and never came back. Since I was too young to be of any use to the officer, he took me to Winnapolis and left me there to fend for myself. That's wrong in so many ways, I said. True, but I ended up being okay for myself. A nice stallion took me in a couple of years later and raised me. It was because of that that I met Bitmap and later Poket Ship. Really? Bitmap smiled wide. Yeah, my older brother was the one who took her in. I'm from here originally, and I would come home now and then to see how he was doing. I met Kitty when she was little. Is that why you two came back here? Poker Ship gave me a funny look. What do you mean? I was told that you two used to be the radio hosts of New Pegasus. And one day you decided to go to Saints Parish? Oh, yeah. Well, if you mean, did we come all the way back here because we're from this area? No. Bitmap's brother died about a year ago. He was running the radio program here before we were. Kitty got a message about us, about us passing, and asked if we'd come out here and help her start up the show again. So we decided it was a good idea to stick a thorn in the ass of the Enclave, and we moved. That, and because we pissed off Mr. Tops. He was going to send some of his robots after us to kill us, Bitmap said. Pokerchip laughed again. That might have played a small part in it. That shut-in needs to learn to take a joke now and then. Anyway, I set up most of the equipment you see here with Bitmap's help, and we made this show into something a few ponies in the area listen to. To a huge hit with most of the ponies in the Twin Cities and the Kingdom. Kitty and Bitmap both sighed. Bitmap saying, yeah, and thanks to that, the Enclave would love to shut us down. I'm sure they would. But they don't know what we look like, apart from Kitty, and they can't find our location, so right now we're safe enough. No one is safe in this city. You three should know that by now, the stranger said from the doorway. Oh, look who decided to finally show up. If it's really you that time, it is. I said with a glare. He looked over at me with his piercing green eyes. It would be in your best interest if you kept quiet, Shadow. You're lucky I didn't gag you. Fuck you. Fuck me? He asked, pushing past the others and putting his bandaged face within inches of mine. Really? Is that the best you can come up with? You're lucky I'm still trying to help you after the shit you pulled. That's because you swore to protect me. I mocked. He slammed me against the wall. I am this close. To throwing you out and letting the Enclave have you, Shadow. I didn't swear to do shit. I'm helping a friend is all. I smiled at him. Yeah, Nightshade, I know all about that. Oh, do you now? Tell me, what do you know about Nightshade and me? I know that Nightshade is a snake that my mother warned me about. He promised her he'd protect me and he'd have a friend do it if he couldn't. I'm assuming that friend is you, stranger? He lied to her, though. He just wants her dead and me right back to the Enclave, so I can be a good lapdog like the rest of those feather-brained idiots. He's the one controlling Stardust. He's the reason everything's going to shit. If he was on my side, he would have already changed Stardust back. I shouted. He threw me a grit into the ground and yelled, Did you ever stop to think that maybe, just maybe, he's trying to do that? That if you didn't go to Middle City Tower and try to kill Stardust and Nightshade, you would have been able to fix everything. But no, you just had to go and get your fucking revenge. You don't need to yell at her, Kitty interrupted. Stay out of this, Kitty. She needs to learn a lesson on what it means to grow up, he said, looking back at me. You're going back to the kingdom. I'll deal with Stardust, not you. 
Do you want to know what I've been doing while you were out? I looked away. Yes. I went back to the kingdom. Told your friends what's been going on all along with the Empress and the Emperor. You stay there until you calm down and grow the fuck up. When we fix Stardust, you'll be there for him. He isn't in his right mind, just like you, Shadow. Your friends have given you multiple chances for the shit you've pulled since you left your stable. You owe Stardust the same respect. Because he's better. He's still going to live with what he had to do when he was pride. I can't do that. He killed... You will, Shadow. Stop acting like a child. Yes, he may have shot Aura, and he may have to deal with that for the rest of his life. Just like you're going to have to deal with the ponies you killed in Appleton and Mill City Tower. I won't let you act like this anymore. You're not a foal or a lost filly anymore. You're a fucking courier. Now start acting like it. I knew he was right, but I didn't want to hear it. I wanted to be justified in my actions. But he was right. Compared to me, Stardust hadn't done anything really bad. He's following orders, and a program was put in his head. I was the one who acted or let my anger overtake me. Not every pony of the Enclave was bad. Some of them just seemed like they were good ponies deep down. Phantom Shot became wrath because of what happened to him thanks to my uncle. But he still died protecting me. Stolsis seemed like a bitch at first. But deep down, she was just the scared daughter who didn't want something bad to happen to her parents. Mom was a good pony. Or she was forced to leave home and so she could save me. Maybe... Just maybe I was looking at all this all wrong. What if I was the bad pony? Finally, I looked up at the stranger and said, I can't change how angry I am, but I know you're right. I'll go back to the kingdom. I don't know what I'll do when I see Stardust again, but I'll try to calm down. You need to start thinking like that before you act, Shadow. You have a bad anger problem. With most ponies, that isn't a dangerous thing because they lack the power to do much. You prove to be deadly when you lose something close to you. That needs to change, because I promise you, it will happen again. You can't start killing every pony you think is evil when bad things happen. That doesn't make you right. It makes you a monster. Just like the monster you told me Aquila is. If you really want to be like her, then keep going down the path you're on. If you don't, then you need to do better. Show us you mean it. He said before taking a step back. Everyone was quiet for a long time. Finally, Solstice broke the silence. Is everything ready to go? He sighed. Yes. I only need you to bring Shadow back to the kingdom for me. Once you've got there there, then our deal will be finished. I can do that. He turned to look at the two stallions and Kitty. Do you think you three can leave out what you know about who took down the tower? Pokerchip winked. Well, it would make a great story for the late show tonight, but I think we can leave out the details about who did it. Sure. I'm sure some point we'll connect the dots since every pony knows who tucked down Appleton with the same weapon, Bimap said. As long as we can give it hidden for a while, that'll help, the stranger said. If Solstice is taking me back, what are you going to be doing? Asked the stranger. I have to fix a lot of things in Nimbus. I'd bring you myself, but I've always been away for too long as it is. I also have to do something to hide Solstice's trail. I understand, but how long are you going to leave me tied up and keep this magic ring on my head? You'll be untied when we leave. The magic canceling ring stays on until one of your friends decides to take it off. You have to prove that you're in a better state of mind. I was about to say something, but realized it wouldn't do me any good, so I sighed. Okay, I can deal with that for now. Can I just ask you something, though? What is it? I did my best to hold back tears. With my anger mostly gone, my emotions of losing Aura were still welling up again. Did my friends bear your for yet? Because if they haven't, I'd like to do that when I get back. I owe her that much. His eyes fell for a moment. I don't know. But laser light will. She's meeting you two halfway to get you back. She'll explain more. 
I gave him a quizzical look. Why is Laser meeting us halfway? She wants to talk to you, I think. She's also going to help Solstice guard you once I'm gone. The Enclave's after both of you, and I'd like to make sure you both make it back to the kingdom safely. You said something about taking care of Stardust. What do you mean? I take it he survived the blast? He sighed again. I don't know for sure, but I believe he did. Reports say they saw a Pegasus matching his description, getting away in the nick of time. I'm going out to find him, and with Nightshade's help, we plan on fixing his memories. What about the other ponies in Stable 97? I asked. Solstice spoke up. From what I know, Nightshade's been planning on ending that program for a while. The stranger nodded. He's going to as soon as we fix what's wrong, and the wrongs that have been committed, then he's shutting down the program and sealing off the stable. Sealing off the stable? I know one pony that wouldn't be happy about that. But with it empty, I'm sure Elder Wolfsbane would have an easier time getting what he wants out of there. What about the ponies that live there? I heard they're all around my age and don't know anything about the outside world yet. The stranger looked down at his hooves. We haven't decided on what to do with them yet. I think you just entered the kingdom. Sheena said she wanted them to help find their families again and get used to life out here. The stranger chuckled. That Sheena's always been a good do-gooder. It's nice to see that in this world. I'll talk to Nightshade when I get back. I was wondering, why do you help Nightshade? From what I've seen of him, he doesn't seem like a good pony, but you talk about him like he's a hero. He's my friend. He always puts on a hard exterior. He figures that if ponies get scared of him, they won't see who he really is. He's a good pony at heart, and he wants to fix the wrongs the Enclave have committed over the years. When I became the new guardian, I offered to help him in any way I could. It's funny because I was helping him, I found you, Shadow. You mean when you found me in FNF Tools? I asked. His eyes went wide. No, I've been following you since you first arrived in Cartwheel. I flew over the cliffs when you were shot. I was heading towards Green Mist Valley at the time, looking for an alarm that went off in the clouds around the area. I heard the shot and saw you go down. I was going to come help, but saw that unicorn rush over to help you, so I stayed back. When I reported what I saw to Nightshade, I told him that it was a stable mare with a silver pit buck. He knew it had to be you. I remember that day when I started to pass out a cartwheel. Guard shot me. Right before I blacked out, a pegasus flew over me. Wait, that was you? I always thought it was Stardust since I met him a couple days later. He laughed. No, Stardust was still south of Cartwheel at the time. I think it was heading north to the day that he saw you fighting the raiders. I saw him attacking the camp, at least, and watched him kill their boss. I thought about the others times I was attacked before FNF tools. Why didn't you show yourself sooner, then? He shrugged. You seem to be doing okay on your own. I figured I'd only show up to help if you really needed me. Then word went out that Winter Frost was going to find you and use you to find Stardust. I went in because I knew you couldn't handle it. I was wrong, though. You were doing a great job until they blocked the back door. I was sick and scared out of my mind, I said angrily. And I came in and helped. You're welcome, he said in a mocking tone. Poker Chip came closer, looked between the two of us, then asked, before you go, is there any way we could get a quick interview with the courier? No, was all the stranger said. Come on, will you stay here and hide? The least you can do to thank us is get us an interview with her, he protested. He glared at Poker Chip. I've done a lot for you three over the years, let's call it payback. She seems calm right now, but that can change fast. Trust me. She needs to get back to her friends. I couldn't help chuckling at the sad look on Poker Chip's face. I'll tell you about Poker Chip. When I'm finished with finding my mom and the crap with the Enclave, I'll make a trip up here and give you an exclusive. His face brightened. Really? Cross my heart, hope to fly, stick a cupcake in my eye. I said with a small smile. I like her. She's cute. Like a bunny rabbit. Poker Chip said. It's a deal. 
The stranger just rolled his eyes. If we're all done with the talk, we should get going. Solstice laughed. I agree. The sooner I'm out of Enclave territory, the better. The stranger walked over to me and cut the ropes that were tied around my hooves. Once I was free, he said, Remember, if you try to run, you won't get far. I know. Can I at least get my barding and weapons back? You can. Solstice is going to be keeping the rangefinder for now. She's giving it to one of your friends when you get back to the kingdom. I think you understand why. He said, moving from one side of the room, then tossing me my saddlebags and barding. The ring you have on your horn will let you use telekinesis at least, enough for your guns. You won't be able to teleport or use the rest of your spells until it's removed. I'm leaving that up to Laser or Sheena. When they feel you are ready to come off, they'll take it off. I frowned. Do you really distrust me so much? Yes, he said, turning back to Solstice. Remember, if she tries to run, use the dart gun I gave you. Yeah, I know. Don't be such a nag, dude, Solstice said, moving over to a set of saddlebags and pulling them on over a set of her leather armor. I'm ready to go. It took me a little longer to get my own barding and dust her on. The stranger was right about me being able to use my telekinesis, but it felt like I was a filly trying to use it for the first time. My magic felt clunky and slow, but I had a feeling I'd get used to it quickly. When I finally got my forehooves through the sleeves, the duster, I said, Ready to go, too. All right, Shadow. I'll carry you out and over the wall. When you're out of sight of the cities, then you two will walk. He said. Kitty came over to me and said, I hope things go better for you, Shadow. It was nice to meet you, even if the circumstances were what they were. Yeah, me too. I'll keep my ears open for your next broadcast. I said to the three before. We made our way back to the quiet streets of Saint's Parish. The entrance to the so-called secret location was literally behind a dumpster that worked like a door in an old alley. The stranger didn't waste any time. He took hold of me and put a hoof on Solstice. Before I could ask what he was doing, he tapped a gem on the inner lining of his coat, and everything around us seemed to slow down. It was almost like we entered Sats, as soon as it was done. He took to the air, with Solstice following close behind. It didn't take long for the spell he used to end. But when it did, we were already beyond the wall and flying south. The hell was that? I asked. It's an old spell that slows time. Or seems to, at least. What it really does is change your perception of time, making it so no one can move faster. It's the original spell that was used to make the spell that went into Sats, created by Minette herself when she used to work back at Stable Tech. And this gem was made by her, and every guardian has owned it, to help us with our task. He replied as he flew faster. Is that how you were able to attack those ponies at FNF Tools when I was in Sats? It is. It's also how I'm able to vanish as quickly as I do, though I can only use the spell for a couple times a day before it needs to recharge. Solstice snickered. Isn't that useful in a fight? I wish I had one. It is. Too bad there's only one in Equestria. Manu didn't like her spellcraft to get out. She invented a lot of very useful spells in her day, she only passed a few of them down to friends and family. The rest she kept in a spell book, which was lost a long time ago. I bet that book would be a great treasure if anybody found it, I said as we started to head towards the ground. It would be, though as far as I know, no ponies ever found the book. I know Grimm was looking for it before you were born, though. I laughed. Not surprised. Mom always liked to learn new spells. And that's very true, the stranger said. But his voice was quiet, and I barely made out what he said. Before I could ask him more, we landed in the dead-looking field. This is as far as I go. Laser should be here soon. I looked around, and it was hard to see how dark it was out. I didn't realize I was out for so long. Yeah, you were out of it for longer than the stranger said you'd be, Solstice said. How long was she out for? The stranger asked. She just woke up not long before you got back. She saw through my disguise, like she said you would, too. And that's strange. The memory orb should have only lasted an hour or so, the stranger said, looking at me. Did something happen before her memory started? Or maybe after? I shrugged. Nothing happened that I know of. The memory took a while to start up, but all I saw was blackness, and that was it. Maybe something's wrong with the memory orb? 
He may want to help me, but I wasn't going to tell him about Oricalis. I had a feeling he'd never leave if he knew my shadow uncle was still alive. Unless that was all a dream or something Aquila was doing to mess with my head again. Though I don't think it was. I could feel her still apart from the small well of power that wasn't quite my own magic. Hmm. I'll have to look into it when I have free time. He said, looking up at the sky for a long moment. Well, can't do anything about him now. You two, stay safe. Just keep heading south from here and you'll see the kingdom in a couple of hours. Solstice gave me a funny look. I thought you said we were going to wait here till our friend showed up. I am, he said, pointing his hoof at a gray and pink blotch flying towards us from the south. She's here. Remember, Shadow, you better keep your nose clean. If not, you will be here to dealing with me. I was about to spawn with a witty, witty retort when the gem in his coat flashed and he was gone. I hate it when he does that. Almost as bad as Watcher. Who's Watcher? Solstice asked. Long story. Not as dirty as it sounds either. I said, looking towards Laser, who was diving toward the ground. She landed quickly, breathing a little heavily from what must have been a long flight. She ducked her wings back once again, hiding them under her flight jacket. I thought I wasn't going to make it in time. I looked down at the ground as she walked over to us. Solstice chuckled. I remember you. You were the mayor that held Cloak at gunpoint at Frosty Summit, then got knocked out. Laser looked at Solstice for a moment, then laughed. Yes, I was. And I remember your, too. The mayor who was outwitted by a cult using a spark grenade. Solstice was taken aback by her remark, but sighed. You know what? Whatever. I don't care. Laser laughed again. I'll admit, though, I'm still a little peeved that I let her knock me out like she did. I'm Laser Light. You must be Solstice. She never told me you'd be here with Shadow. I took this moment to pull out my goggles and masks so I could see in the dark better. When they were on, I looked over to Solstice. For the first time, I'd been able to get a good look at her cutie mark. It was a snowflake, a budding flower, a green leaf, and then a brown leaf. They all formed a circle. Her electric cutie mark was the seasons changing, winter at the top, then spring, followed by summer and then autumn. Solstice was a fitting name for her. Right as I figured that out, I felt Laser take hold of me and pull me into my tug. Do you have any idea how worried we all were for you? I let my face sink into her chest as she held me tight. I'm sorry. Also, you're very sweaty. She didn't let me go, and I felt a tear fall on my head. Don't ever run away like that again, do you hear me? It was bad enough that, after that scare with Aura, then you went and vanished on us. We wanted all to go look out for you. But we couldn't leave. I thought Wingnut was going to destroy the mansion when he saw the blast of light in the distance. I knew right away what it was. The radio host said later that Mill City Tower was destroyed, but nothing after that. I didn't know what to say, so I just kept my face in her chest and repeated, Sorry. She finally let me go and pulled my chin up, making me look her in the eyes. What made you do something like that? We all thought you ran off because of what you promised Stardust. We never thought you'd go and destroy the tower. I tried to look away, but Laser didn't let me. When Aura died, something broke inside of me and I lost myself for a little while. I'm not sure, but I fixed myself yet or if I'm still in shock. I wanted so badly to kill Stardust after what he did to her. That's why I left. She looked utterly confused and started to say, What are you talking about? Then something behind me made a cheerful sounding beeping noise. I jumped and screamed, trying to hide behind Laser as a strange-looking sprite bot floated towards us, making those strange-sounding beeps. What the fuck is that? She looked at the sprite bot and sighed. Vena, I told you to wait until we talked to her. The robot bobbed up and down and made an assortment of beeps and chirps. It took a moment to examine what it looked like. The sprite bot had a chrome body, looking almost new but still worn out. I had seen a lot of action. Its appendage coming out of the bottom of its spherical body. At the top were two antennae with a solid metal sphere at the tips. Its grating looked like other sprout bites too. I have seen Watcher communicate with, but its eyes weren't the normal green I was used to seeing. Those eyes were bright and warm red, and its wings were transparent green instead of transparent blue. When it finished, I asked, 
Is this a sprite bot that's only around the Twin Cities, or is Watcher making his own now? The sprite bot made an angry sounding beep, and a shot of spark of electricity at me. I yipped and hid behind Laser again. She laughed. This is Vina. My son made him for me not long ago. He's always with me, but normally I tell him to keep himself hidden when I'm around other ponies that I don't know too well. He has his own special kind of personality, and doesn't like being compared to normal sprite bots. Vina, this is Shadow. Be nice. Vina? I didn't even know you had a sprite bot. Is he broken? Because he isn't saying anything but strange beeping noises. I shot a spark at me again, then moved over to chirp at Laser again. She sighed. I mean it. Be nice to her. Shadow, say hello and say you're sorry for saying he's broken. No way! He's a fucking robot, he can't even talk. At least Wasp can talk. I said, sticking my tongue out at the flying robot. Solstice just laughed, watching us. That looks like a sprite bot, a Pegasus and Stratus always has with him. Laser shot a cold look at Solstice. I'd keep that information to yourself, child. She put up her hooves. I didn't mean anything by it. I swear. I was just making an observation. Laser sighed. Sorry. I didn't mean anything by it either. I just got protective of Vina. It was the last thing my son gave to me before I left. I sighed. As fun as this all is to sit here in the middle of nowhere, can we get going? Oh, yes. We should start heading back. As she said that, she scanned the sky like she was waiting for some pony to show up. What are you looking for? I asked. Hugo looked at me. Oh, nothing. Just making sure no Enclave patrols is around is all. My EFS isn't showing any hostiles. I think we're good. We started to walk south before Laser spoke up again. The robot floating happily along next to her. Shadow, after everything that happened over the last couple of days and what you did, I was wondering if there's anything I can do to help. I can tell by looking at you that something's wrong. She sighed and looked at Solstice. Yeah, I don't know if I can say it right now. Laser looked at Solstice too. I seemed to understand what I was thinking. Solstice, would you mind flying ahead a little of us so Shadow and I can talk in private? You too, Vina. Solstice shrugged. No, I don't care either way. Just make sure you two don't fall behind. I'm not stopping again. We need to get to the kingdom. The sooner, the better. She flew off, the robot following. When we were far enough ahead of us, I finally started to talk. I feel like what happened to Aura is my fault. Why do you say that, Shadow? She couldn't have known that she'd be shot by Stardust. I know. But if I didn't leave that night because I was too scared to talk to her about how I felt, she'd still be here. She only had to go off and save me because I was wandering off again. If I would have stayed in the mansion, both her and Phantom Shot would still be alive, still. She looked at me, confused again. Who's Phantom Shot? Oh, right. Uh, Phantom Shot is Wrath's real name? Oh, well, from what I'm gathering, even if he did die, he did so protecting you. He did that because you helped him remember who he was. You also can't blame yourself for Aura getting shot. That could have happened at any time. We live in a dangerous world. I know. I just feel like it's my fault because it was me who she had to go find. It was stupid of me on my part to leave, alone, with no weapons. She chuckled. No matter how safe you think you might be, you're still in the wasteland. Even if you're in a city like the Kingdom or Frosty Summit or even New Pegasus. The only stupid thing you did was getting careless. But you're also still a young mare. Mistakes like that are normal for a pony your age. I don't feel like a young mare anymore, I said. She reached out and rubbed my mane like I did with Wingnut. Maybe not, but you're still are no matter what you think. There are times when I can't tell who's more a mature one, you or Wingnut. Hey, I'm not as bad as that little twerp. She smiled again. Yes, you are. You may not like to hear it because you're a couple years older than him, but there are a lot of times when he makes better decisions than you do. He's lived in the wasteland his entire life, whereas you grew up most of your life in a stable. He may act like a perverted lech now and then, but that's just because he's a cult going through that time of his life where his hormones are taking over a lot. 
Most of the time, he can be a charming young stallion, though. Maybe you're right. I know I haven't been acting like an adult as of late. You also have a lot going on in your life. Your mother's trying to kill you. You're trying to fight the Enclave. You have to protect the Mark II. You have so much going on. On top of that, you're also going through a change as well. That has to do with your body and mind confused. I remember it was like at your age, when I started feeling differently towards ponies. Well, in your case, a griffin. I sighed. You noticed it too, huh? That you like Dora? Shadow, I'm not blind. And I'm a mother. I saw when I first met you back when you were with Silver. The night we did... things. To be honest, that wasn't one of my best memories. She laughed nervously, rubbing the back of her head. I noticed that you mostly played around with her because you thought it was fun. You liked her, that was easy to tell, and she made your life exciting because you were able to be yourself without having to worry about the Novermare saying, you can't do that. But even then, I saw how you looked at Aura. You two have chemistry. It's rare nowadays. You tease each other like it's second nature. You never shy away from her touch. You smile when she says something to you. Be it an insult or a compliment. I also happened to hear you yell at the top of your lungs your true feelings when you were at the balcony with Sheena. I knew it was you by your voice. I just happened to be on the ground at the moment, looking up at the sky where my home used to be. The first step is acceptance of it all. I started to cry. I couldn't hold it back anymore. The emotions were overwhelming me. I wish I would have known how I felt before Stardust killed her. Oh, Shadow, please don't cry. I know life can be hard and confusing, especially for someone like you. You have a lot of new feelings around inside of you right now, and mixing that with the trauma you've had to go through, it's understandable. She then stopped. That's why you went off, because you thought he killed her. Shit, no wonder you must have left before. A bullet ripped in my barding, slamming me to the ground. I was luckily hit in the shoulder area, and it didn't go through. But it still felt like somebody kicked me there. I cursed and twisted around, looking up at the lone Pegasus who was pulling back the bolt of a sniper rifle. He took aim and fired. Laser was quicker, though. She took hold of me and pulled me out of the way just in time. Once that was finished, she twisted around, pulled her energy rifle off her back and fired back up at him. It took a moment to pull the flattened bullet out of my shoulder, before looking up to watch as Stardust avoided the next shot laser aimed up at him. As she did, she yelled, It's time, Solstice! Protect Shadow! Vina, send the signal! Shadow Star, I don't care what Nightshade wants or any pony else. You've attacked the Enclave for the last time. It's time to die! He yelled down at me, trying to get off another shot. I tried to draw Dreamwalker, but Solstice took hold of me and flew me away from Laser and Stardust. As she did, what Laser said finally registered. What did she mean it's time? We knew Stardust would come after you. This was the plan from the beginning. Now keep quiet. The other should be here in a minute. Wait, what? I said, then Stardust slammed into Solstice, knocking me out of her grip and sending me rolling across the field. She landed not far away. Stardust slammed into me, knocking the wind out of my lungs and leaving me gasping. He slammed a hoof into my face, then pulled out a sidearm. Die, bitch! An ear-splitting scream rolled over both of us, Stardust flying back and me screaming from the pain in my head. Then Windthresher knelt landed, standing over me and looking at Stardust, who aimed his sidearm at the bat pony. She growled, yelling, I won't let you hurt more of my friends! Then she opened her muzzle and screamed again. Then another pony came out of nowhere and slammed into Stardust, throwing him back to the side. It was Cutter, flying in behind him to deal with another blow to Stardust was Doorstop, yelling, Time to teach you a lesson, cadet! Solstice moved in to help the older drill sergeant as Cutter came up to try and attack him from behind. Laser fired a rifle to keep him from getting his shots off of his own. As I watched, I looked up at Windthresher and asked, What's going on? She stepped aside, then pulled me into a tight hug. I'll explain later. Let's just say that we set up a trap to finally try and capture Stardust. I kept watching for a moment, and then said, What kind of trap? She smiled with her toothy grin. A good one. You feel like helping us get him back for good, or are you still lost in dark thoughts? 
I didn't know what else to do. But I think I'm good now. At least enough to help. I said. She laughed. Good. Now, let's get our old friend back. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Seeds of the past. After seeing how certain past events have unfolded, you now have a different grasp on the reality of your situation, and may make more positive choices in the future. Note, this perk does not negate any dark perks that you have attained, or may attain in the future. It is easier for you to take the civil route rather than the violent, with certain characters from your past. New quest perk added. Mysterious Stranger, Rank 3. You have reached a new understanding of the pony you call The Stranger. You know more about his past and why he's helping you, and you have a better bond with him. The mysterious stranger will now show up more often in sets, to help you out when you're in a bind. Keep it up, and you may find out who he really is. That is, if he doesn't try to kill you.